How do you think about competition? Are you worried about competition in the field? Do you sort of just do your own thing? We are, we are happy to see people take similar ideas to the clinic ahead of us. You don't have to be first in class if you're best in class. This month, it is my pleasure to be joined by Dr. Ashok Bandaranaka. Um, Ashok completed his PhD in immunology at the University of um, at the University of Washington in Seattle, and after grad school, he joined the Albert Einstein College of Medicine as a faculty member, where a DoD project using proteins to protect soldiers from radioactivity further inspired his passion for biotech. Ashok then spent the next decade at the Fred Hutch in Seattle, where he was part of the Olson Lab working on Project Violet and ended up as the Director of Immunology and Automation of the Hutch's Protein Therapeutics Program. This is where Link, Ashok's current startup venture, was founded. With a superstar co-founding team of industry veterans and friends, Ashok and team are developing first-in-class uh, next-gen T-cell engaging therapies to enable durable responses in cancer patients. With their technology progressing to the clinical phase as soon as next year, Ashok and Link are poised to take a big swing at cancer. Welcome, Ashok. It's great to have you. Um, great to be here. Very excited, and thanks to Benchling for for hosting this session and in, uh, and inviting me. Awesome. Well, Ashok, before we get started, it'd be awesome if you could just give us a little more background about yourself. Um, you know, for the audience, maybe about how you got into science and just kind of what you're working on. Sure thing. Um, so, um, I guess I'll go back a little bit because some of this. Uh, may have some relevance to our conversation later, but um, I actually uh, started college in the US um, as an international student. Um, that was my first exposure uh, to college here, and that was an interesting exposure that shared a lot, you know, that kind of shaped a lot of my views. Um, and um, I, I joined a small community college, um, and, you know, I was a pretty uh, small, you know, a part of a pretty small minority population. Um, and then I moved to UC Davis, which was a much bigger campus and a, and a lot more diverse campus. Uh, and that's where I did my undergrad in biochemistry. Um, I, you know, from the beginning, I was very interested in research. Um, and um, I think to the chagrin of my uh, very Asian parents, I wasn't really interested in doing the MD track. Um, so I was going to be a, a real doctor. Uh, but, um, but, you know, I was, I was interested in um, addressing patient needs from kind of the other side, right? So not in the face-to-face, one-on-one interaction, but, but rather from kind of the therapeutic angle, uh, making the best, um, the best therapeutics that we can. Um, and so that kind of led me to pursue a PhD in immunology because I thought that was, um, you know, at least when I was, uh, considering grad school in the early 2000s, that, that was kind of the, the hot field uh, and, and a very therapeutically relevant field. Um, so I joined UW Immunology, uh, which was one of the best programs, uh, you know, in the country. Um, and um, I kind of, through my grad career, was constantly working um, on projects with kind of a therapeutic focus. Um, and that's what led to some of the work I did that got me recruited to Albert Einstein. Um, and then actually back to Seattle, I, I came back uh, to join a group uh, where, you know, uh, one of my good friends from grad school uh, was already in the group. And, and, you know, he said that I should join this group because they were going to do good things. And, um, and I, you know, here we are, we fast forward a little bit and, and we launched Link. Awesome. Well, it's, it's definitely a, an awesome story. We're super excited to kind of dive into it here. I think I want to start with just your, your journey into biotech from academia. Uh, I know a lot of folks that are, are watching or thinking about founding companies or maybe have founded companies have kind of gone through this uh, decision where they are you going to stay in academia? Are you going to move to biotech and how that sort of works? So maybe can you talk me through um, your process there? Yes, yeah, so, you know, um... There, there are a few different ways you can come into this uh, problem or, or, or decision. And um, for me, it was kind of from the beginning, it was pretty biotech focused because, um, you know, uh, academia doesn't do therapeutics very well, right? Uh, the, it's a great 
test bed. It's a great foundation for kind of launching new products, uh, for launching new ideas. Uh, but when it comes to the actual execution of like getting a drug into the clinic, uh, that's kind of where there's a bit of a disconnect. Um, and and because from the beginning, I was very interested in that part of the process. Um, I, I decided early on that, you know, biotech was where I wanted to go. Um, then the question became, you know, how do you get in? Uh, you know, where, you know, which which outfit should I join? Uh, at what level should you join? Uh, right out of grad school, you can kind of do like one of these biotech postdoc type things. Um, and and again, you know, I I, I was tr trying to manage uh, my expectations of uh, getting drugs to the clinic and uh, not spending a lot of time, uh, kind of working up the ranks to be able to really affect that uh, process. Um, and so I kind of held out for a little bit, hoping to either join at a much higher level or ideally, you know, spin out my my own biotech. And um, fortunately that strategy worked out. Um, so, so I, you know, for those that are considering it or wondering how to do it, I would, I would recommend, uh, you know, thinking of your situation and and kind of understanding what like what exactly do you want to do in biotech and and then kind of map your trajectory so when you say you held out for a while um, you were obviously working and so were you working on a, a problem that you thought you wanted to go super deep on so that you could come in at a higher level at a biotech um, or, or, or against found link in this case but uh, how did you kind of think about the work that you were doing in that period where you were still in academia um, I I thought of it more from a skills perspective, right? So so it wasn't like um, I wasn't thinking, oh, I'm going to do this one project that's going to be like, oh, that's going to be the drug, and then I just move into biotech and and take the project with me or something. Um, I was more coming at it from the perspective of what are really useful skills I can build uh, and and kind of develop uh, in myself that would be very relevant to a biotech career. Um, so I did my PhD in immunology. Uh, I worked on cancer projects during my grad uh, career. Uh, I worked on the NF-kappa B signaling pathway, which is heavily dysregulated in oncology. Um, and then as I went to Albert Einstein, that was that was a great you know experience in terms of working for the New York Structural Genomics Research Consortium, which is a much, you know, it, it's a it's a huge group of people. Uh, there was a lot of automation. There was a lot of science happening, and so those were like all the skills that I wanted, right? So I, I went from biochemistry to immunology to picking up automation, um, and those are skills that, you know, I used at the Hutch and and we still use at Link. Um, so kind of that's what I thought if I were to go into kind of the traditional uh, biotech path, uh, those skills would serve me well. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, kind definitely. Of on this journey, uh, on this journey through, if there were any like mentors that you had or mentors that you sought out in order to um, kind of make these decisions and plan your career? Yeah, so uh, in terms of mentors, um, I guess you know the the traditional model is you you go for you know like the the Nobel laureate or something and then you like join their lab and you know then your career is set. Uh, but again, I, I was coming at it maybe at the time naively uh, from a very like skills focused perspective, right? And and those Nobel laureates don't have time for grad students and postdocs. Like you're you're usually shunted off to one of their scientists, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So, so uh, you know that's. What I looked for in mentors were people that could um, affect um, how I did things, how I thought about things, uh, the skills I could learn, um, and and so those were the labs that I picked. Um, and you know, coming uh, coming back to the Olsen lab or coming back to the Hutch, joining the Olsen lab was one of those critical decisions because Jim Olsen had already spun out two biotech companies. He was obviously not shy about taking companies, you know, uh, uh, out of the hutch. Um, and, and so I thought, oh, okay, that's great. Um, and then, you know, I, during my interview, I told him, you know, I've been picking up automation and that's where I think, you know, the future of drug design and development is going. Others obviously have been thinking the same thing, like in biotech and pharma. Um, and he said, okay, if you join us, I'll, you know, you can buy a million dollar robot and I signed one the next day. So. 
<laughs> so when 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 is this? In, in this is like seven years ago. You were at the Hutch for for quite a while, right? That's right. Yep. Can you, can you tell me a little bit more about like your experience at, at the Hutch and and how that like kind of what you were doing there, and then maybe the transition to to founding Link. Yeah. So um, so I actually came back to the Hutch right because in grad school I was already working yeah. with a PI at the Hutch, um, and that's kind of uh, you know he helped get me into uh, my position at Albert Einstein. Um, and so coming back to the Hutch was was really like kind of coming back home. And um, I was very familiar with the uh, with the system, uh, not necessarily with the Olsen lab. Uh, but like I said, one of my uh, uh, really good friends from grad school was already there. So it was kind of a very easy decision, easy transition. Um, I actually still remember, um, I think it was I was still in New York and I had just gotten married and it was a homecoming in Sacramento uh, that my friend and my former mentor actually came out to my homecoming and we were like chatting it up and having a good time and like, you know, partying during the homecoming. And the next morning, my wife was like, okay, so when are we moving back to Seattle? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so it was kind of almost, you know, preordained that we were going to come back and, um, and, you know, the Olsen Lab was a great environment for me to continue developing skills, build out my automation uh, skills. Um, and that led to our idea for Link, which was, it was actually not something that the Olsen Lab was actively working on, right? Antibodies, they were uh, a small protein peptide group. Uh, and so antibodies was kind of on the other scale of the protein spectrum. Um, and, uh, but again, to Jim's credit, he was like, oh, you know, your preliminary data looks great. He's a good idea. You know, you should, you should run with this. And, and so he supported us to kind of get this idea, uh, going. And, um, we already had industry veterans in the Olsen lab, um, uh, from like from Amgen, uh, our CSO is from Amgen, our director of ops is from Amgen, uh, all the Seattle site, uh, you know, when they shut down, uh, they kind of joined the hutch and looked for other positions. Um, and so, so it was this really cool environment of doing academic research, but with a very like almost biotech like feel. Um, and, and that's where some of our ideas came. We, we didn't want to, um, build a company for the sake of building a company. We we really wanted to uh, affect patients and, and we really wanted to make uh, what we thought were, you know, the, the best drugs we could. Um, and so that was kind of the, the big idea of these bispecifics and multispecifics, which now is becoming more in vogue. But back then people were like, oh, this is crazy. The cost of go goods is going to kill you. you. You can't, this is not a drug, you know. Uh, but but I think we've proven that wrong. So so you have good preliminary results at the Hutch. You you see that there's probably a company that can be built there. Um, you see that there's like a need in the patient population. How do you go about spinning out? I, and I guess like as you said, I yes. had some experience here, um, but perhaps you didn't. So maybe talk to that. Yeah. So that's. Um, I mean. I think I think whenever the the history of Link is written, it'll sound like we made some really smart strategic moves, and 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 some of them were. But there's a there's a big luck component involved, right? And there's just a kind of a timing component. Uh, and our, our first attempt at spinning out Link um, back then it wasn't called Link, uh, but uh, it actually failed. The the mm -hmm. VC that was interested, we you know we were connected to them through the business office at the Hutch and. The conversations were going really well and they were progressing and we thought, okay, here we go, we're going to launch. Um, and they pulled out like, you know, right, uh, uh, right at the end, just before we signed the, all the paperwork. And, uh, you know, in retrospect, that was the best thing that could have happened to us because that, um, like, like you said, we weren't uh, we weren't familiar with, uh, you know, actually launching a company as such, um, at least ourselves, uh, and that was a very eye-opening experience, and and that kind of shaped our uh, investment strategy uh, for Link. So, in that initial kind of so failed attempt for the, of, uh, in the initial failed attempt with the the VC, did you 
like come to them with your preliminary results and then maybe like a plan for the next year or so. And that was what you were going to secure funding on or what was your strategy there? And then how did it change once that fell through and how did you secure funding going forward? Yeah, so so we had uh, preliminary results. We had a strategy and that's kind of what we spoke to. We said, look, you know, this is kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, not a lot of people are trying to do this right now, but this is where we think the field is going. Um, you know, you you can't make these very basic by specifics. Uh, that's not how uh, you know cancer works. That's not how T cells work. Uh, you know, here's our big idea. Here's some preliminary results. Um, you know, what do you guys think? Um, and you know, one of the issues with going to VCs is um, um, they they always ask, you know, so what's your big idea? How are you different uh, to all the other people we see every day? Uh, and then you tell them your big idea and they're like, oh, I mean, that sounds risky. <laughs> you know, that, that sounds like, you know, uh, we might not get a 10 or 20 X on that. Uh, can you kind of reel that back and, and do something simple? <laughs> and it's yeah, like, yeah. You know, that's, that's kind of the, the balance you got to strike. Do you, do you feel like uh, you were able to not reel back and and then secure funding that that really was the idea that you initially had? Initially had. Yeah. So so what we um, so so that actually really shaped our thinking, right? So we decided, okay, the VCs are not ready to go all in on this big idea. And so talking to a, a lot of our kind of uh, like mentors and talking to people in the in the VC space and uh, you know our industry contacts, uh, we thought, okay, let's let's a try to find a more strategic partnership. So so let's not make this fully VC funded and led uh, because they obviously have their own bottom line to think about and and they're not willing to take this big swing, right? Because it, it sounds too risky. Um, so let's find a more strategic partnership um, and let's try to develop our data package even further um, to kind of make this a, a better proposal. Um, and, and again, that's where, you know, academia is great because we were able to just iterate on our ideas. We were able to test more molecules. Automation obviously helps there. Um, and and so, so, we started looking for more industry contacts that might want to partner with us. Um, and uh, in a very, again, this is where kind of luck plays a role. Uh, one of the lead uh, people in the previous VC we were talking to, um, uh, who was a big fan of idea and was actually kind of gutted by their company, you know, their, their firm pulling out, yeah. had just moved to BMS and said, yeah you know, I know you guys, I like this idea. Let's, let's try to craft a deal here. Um, and so then BMS, uh, you know, showed interest. Um, and, and then they brought in, uh, you know, uh, uh, their, one of their LPs uh, to, to provide some of the funding. Um, and, and so that's kind of how uh, Link uh, kind of fully spun out. Uh, but prior to that, um, I should give a nod to uh, groups like uh, the Washington Research Foundation that signed on to our idea when it was basically just an idea. Yeah. And they said, we like this. We, they made one of the biggest in, you know, academic investments uh, to our group. Um, the Emerson Collective came right after, signed on, uh, you know, funded us as, uh, at the academic stage. Um, and then the continue to support us at, at link and and that was kind of the the stepping stone uh, to uh, uh, to to get you know link fully spun out because that obviously takes you know a lot more money yeah yeah definitely um well so amazing so you you, you get some early funding you're able to then secure a strategic partnership with BMS um tell me a bit more about sort of uh how link was then built so you, you've got the money you need to get the people yeah, you've you got the money the I think there was a pandemic that was happening right at the the start of this. So uh, maybe talk through some of those those details. Yeah. So so one of the things I learned, um, kind of 
in grad school and then more at Albert Einstein was the the power of of teams, right? Uh, because um, so automation is kind of funny, right? Most most people think, oh, you know, if you have a if you have this big million dollar robot, then you just like fire everybody and and you know the robot just does all the work. That's completely, you know, the opposite of what happens, right? We actually hired more people uh, because what automation does is, you know, it's a it's a force multiplier, right? But but you still need that core group, um, and so so that's something that I I really wanted to do right at the hutch, and and Jim gave me a lot of leeway to do that is to build a, a solid team, right? Um, and and you know. Um, uh, so I built this core group that was kind of built, uh, you know, had automation kind of at the center. But then uh, this this really good team of science initial conversations about spinning out link. Uh, that's something I told Jim that you know I would definitely want to take at least a part of this team with me. Um, and and you know, the then the pandemic hit. And so we decided, okay, maybe we shouldn't all immediately transition to link because you know the funding was still not we were not sure how much of it we would get and and you know how big we could be. Um, and that's again where academia kind of helped us out because we were able to continue developing our program at the hutch uh, before fully spinning out. so so I wasn't actually a full FTE at link uh, <laughs> until like just last year. <laughs> Yeah, so there's a little bit of time kind of a, b between the two. Uh, maybe a question for you that, to go back to what you said is automation being a force multiplier. Uh, when you're thinking about the folks you need to kind of um, get the, the maximum impact out of a million dollar robot, are you hiring data scientists? Are you hiring process engineers? Are they like hardcore molecular biologists? What, what kind of profiles were you looking for in order to like augment your, your automation? Yeah, so the way I... Um... I, I guess I look at automation um, as a force multiplier, right? So, so you know, some groups will, uh, you know, automation is their DNA, right? Wow. But for, for at least for my group, automation is more like a tool, right? So, so I wanted the best kind of research, like biochemists, uh, molecular biologists, like protein engineering, you know, background scientists that were willing to learn and leverage automation. Yeah. Um, and so, so it wasn't like, you know, we are not like an automation group. We are like a R&D group that uses automation. Um, yeah. And so that's kind of, that was also important to get that DNA right because uh, we didn't have like an automation engineer. We didn't have uh, like, you know, a, a limbs like scientist, you know, yeah. it, it was, a research group that was leveraging automation. And, and I think that has worked well for us um, so far. Can you talk a little bit about um, sort of your hiring philosophy around building a really good culture? Like how, how do you how do you build a company where people want to come to work every day, where people are excited, uh, where they're kind of mission driven? Yeah, I, I, I think um, <clears throat> so, you know, I, I guess the, the, uh, the easy response is like, oh, you got to invest in your team and you got to, you know, like do these kumbaya things and stuff like that. But, but you know, it, I, I kind of tend to take it more from like a, um, like a Maslow's like hierarchy perspective. Like you, you got to build that foundation, right? And, and for a lot of our junior scientists, uh, it's all about, you know, helping them like do well in life. Um, so, so at Link, we take, uh, you know, pay very seriously. We we pay above average uh, for all our positions. Uh, we took stock options very seriously early on. We gave them more stock options uh, than uh, you know average for that position uh, because no, you know, you you literally have to put your money where your mouth is, right? Like so, so I could I could do all the you know like uh, you know uh, lunches and you know. Uh, do all the pats on the back and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, they want to know that you, you know, like literally value them and, and that they have a stake in the company. Um, and so that's something we decided very early on as a leadership group uh, that we would do is, is always try to pay above the median, give more stock options, give uh, aggressive bonuses, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. do that part. And then it's a you know the culture part comes in after that where 
you know, it's 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 all about um, at, at least for me as a manager, it's all about respecting the team, not micromanaging, uh, giving them development opportunities, actually listening to you know listening to what they want to do for their career, right? Because you know what what I don't want to happen is for one of my FTEs to think that the only way they can progress or do something you know different that they really want to do is to leave link and and join some other outfit right um and so so i i check in with you know with them very regularly um i kind of try to put into place uh you know development plans for their career uh and then try to align that with link strategy and and link's future yeah so, so I, so I, I I'm guess I'm hearing first make sure they're paid, um, and then after that, you know, make sure that they have all the opportunities they need to be really excited about about their work. Um, when we spoke last, you had mentioned sort of how important diversity, equity, and inclusion are to you specifically for for folks entering the sciences, for folks in STEM. Um, can you just talk a little bit more uh, about your thoughts there, what you meant, um, you know, what you think the industry can do better, and academia for that? Yeah. Matter. So. Yeah, and and I think um, you know the um, the the STEM uh, field in general has done I think a pretty good job. Um, you know, again, much more to do. Uh, you know, and and as our ideas of of diversity, uh, you know, uh, increase and and you know as we uh, uh, try to include everybody, uh, there's a lot more work to do. But in general, I think, especially uh, at least on the coasts, uh, you know, the STEM field uh, at the undergrad level, I would say, from my own personal experience, is is getting a lot better. And there's a lot more diversity. There's a lot more inclusion. But but now I feel like the bottleneck has just moved further up, right? And and that's you know, so so when you get to the founder level, when you get to the C suite, again you see a very narrowing of the of that diversity and, and of that inclusion. Um and and you know it's it's not necessarily I mean I, I honestly don't think that it's companies saying, oh we we don't want to be diverse. Uh it's it's companies saying, well where are the diverse candidates that we can hire from? Right. And and that's that's an issue for Link too, because you know, even though I, I want to uh be as like inclusive and hire as diverse a, a group as possible, I still want the best scientists. Yeah. Right. So yeah. so 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 I think right now what we need to do is kind of bridge that gap uh and and make sure that the the increase in diversity we are seeing at the undergrad level is continued to push up. And and you have better programs that kind of take those populations further up into the higher levels, um, and and almost have this kind of bridge between academia and biotech, uh, because something grad school does very poorly is prepare you for biotech, right? And um, old mentor Jim Olson is is kind of trying to try to affect change in that area uh, with a program he started at uh, Seattle Children's now, uh, but but there's still a lot of of work to do there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. maybe I kind of digging into the yeah, digging into preparation the for, for biotech uh, in, in Jim Olson's program. What does it look like to be more prepared for a career in biotech coming from academia? Um, you know, I, I think it's um, some of the very basic things. Um, you know, academia, as in the undergrad and even grad level doesn't even prepare you to be a proper principal investigator, right? A, a proper professor, right? You're, yeah. At least when I was in grad school, you're not taught about running a lab. You're not taught about, you know, a, a budget. You're not taught about like balancing books. You're not taught about hiring and, and you know, managing people. Like that stuff that you kind of somehow have to like pick up by like osmosis or something, yeah. right? And yeah. Um, and and so more programs that are geared towards that, uh, and and back when I was in grad school, um, you know, biotech was thought of as like the dark side, right? Like yeah. all these professors yeah. would think that oh, they're the only like pure like research uh, academics, and and if you're going into biotech, you're kind of like, you know, it's it's almost like uh, uh, you know a failure or something, or or you're kind of. You know, leaving this ivory tower or something. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and and that's that's absolutely not true. And and I don't think biotech is for everyone, but for those that want to pursue that career, you, you know, you gotta you gotta prepare them for that. 
Yeah, it's interesting. It's com- almost like how I didn't learn how to play my taxes in high school. You know, it was like osmosis for that too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, well, maybe we can go to uh, just a few personal questions for a moment. Um, I'd love to know just like what a typical day looks like for you. Um, maybe some habits that you consider like essential to you know, operating really effectively. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm a founder of a fledgling biotech and I'm a dad of two little kids. So, uh, you know, routine is not, <laughs> not, not the, the, the routine is there is no routine, but, uh, uh, but I think one of the things that I, I really value and, and that's really important to me is my, uh, like my early mornings with, with my daughters, right? Because, uh, my, my wife is not a morning person. She'll, she'll wake up like 10 times at night, but she cannot do mornings. Um, and so, and my kids insist on waking up at five o'clock for some, for some reason. Um, and, and so that's my shift basically. So I, I wake up at five, I take them down and, uh, you know, breakfast, hanging out with them. That's, that's my kind of routine start to the day that I, that I value a lot. And, and that kind of, um that that kind of um sets the day for me and and i come into link kind of excited and and i come in like you know ready to go um uh because because i've been up for like four hours (laughs) yeah (laughs) the day's not young anymore for you (laughs) huh um well that sounds fun not a bad way to start your day with your children uh what's the best advice you've ever received putting you on the spot with us you on the spot uh best advice um i i think the best advice uh, it was kind of like negative advice was like biotech is hard uh founding a biotech is impossible um you should think of other career choices <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and but but that was you know uh back to your you know back to your mentor question um mentors don't have to be um, you know this this sage that kind of like leads you by the hand and and gives you these like snippets of wisdom, right? A, me- a mentor could be kind of the complete opposite. It could be someone yeah. that's telling you, yeah. you can't do this. Like these are all the issues you're going to run into. These are all the problems. Um, that's great info. I mean, that's great information. You're you're actually, you know, you're actually mapping out the pitfalls. Um, and and so, um, so I think I think. One of uh, one of the best pieces of advice is basically telling me you can't like this is not a good idea. <laughs> so, uh, and and I yeah, and I think very you know, at, at Link, I think it's it's counterintuitive. And and I think you know Link has like as a as the leadership group, we are all of that mind. We we just yeah, just from even our drug development strategy, uh, we just love when somebody says, "Oh, this is a bad idea. You can't do that," uh, because we're like. Great. Now, now we know where the competition isn't. <laughs> yeah, watch us. That's so funny. Watch us. <laughs> I guess the best advice you've ever received is advice you, you didn't take in this case. Um, would you do anything differently, Ashok, yeah. if you were going back kind of through your, your career? Are there other decisions you would have made or things you might have changed? Um, yeah, I, I, I guess philosophically, I, I don't... Um, I try not to look back and think about what I would have done differently or what was a mistake because I think if if you're like you can do a million things differently, right? Uh, I mean, at Link, I would I would say like, oh, we shouldn't have talked to that first VC group early on because you know that didn't go anywhere. But that's not true because that then connected us to that next, uh, you know, gave us the connection. Uh, to to BMS and and our eventual like spin out right so um, so yeah I, I I try not to look back and think about what we would have done differently because you could be in a completely different place now right like if you had yeah. done those things differently Link may have actually never spun out um, and and so uh, but what I try to do instead is um, look back and think what have we learned. Uh, you know, uh, what are important lessons? Um, 
what um, uh, what could we do differently in terms of uh, you know like timing or what could we do differently in terms of uh, you know like you know COVID for instance was a great learning experience in the sense that it it told us uh, you know build out for redundancy build out you know like this is where like platforms like uh, you know to give you guys a plug this is where but you know, platforms like Benchling are, are critical, right? Because we could tell our, uh, you know, bench scientists during COVID, please don't all come in at once. Yeah. You know, uh, if you're sick, take the day off. We we will, you know, move things around. We can track everything through our database, uh, you know, through Benchling. Uh, you know, uh, people can pick up where other scientists have left off. Uh, you know, so so I think I think that's one of the major lessons I learned from COVID is to just prepare for the unexpected and build in redundancy, uh, uh, build in a very flexible, uh, a very high performing team that are cross trained, right? So so I, I always draw you know whenever I have one of these like uh, you know uh, team meetings I always draw like you know these Venn diagrams of of what everybody's skills are and and I want to make sure that every skill is at least overlapped by one or two people right uh, and and that that may not be their key skill uh, but they have sufficient knowledge of that where if someone was to take a day off or a week off or they were to come down with COVID the, the entire platform doesn't just collapse, right? Uh, because automation is only good as like, uh, you know, what you feed it and and what data you pull out of it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Venn yeah. diagram is pretty cool. I might try it my own team. Um, I guess, yeah, the, the, to, the plug for Benchling is great. And it's, you know, kind of shifting to this world where we're not just like writing in a paper notebook that we take home every day, but sort of having this like non-silo database. It's like Salesforce where you can just kind of pick up where anybody is and, and keep going They're pretty cool and and that's why i'm you know we we just demoed your uh your new workflows uh module and and we're excited about that because that's how i've always thought of my team right it's it's like this pipeline like this discovery development pipeline and you know you have some people that are highly skilled at certain positions but you want people to be able to pinch hit and you want people to be able to you know backfill and and uh, that's how you build a, a very robust, stable uh, pipeline, right? And we definitely haven't gotten it all right, uh, and and you know we are definitely still working on it. Uh, but but those are those are the tools, and that's the kind of mindset I think uh, that that you need and that we've adopted uh, post COVID. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so yeah, um, awesome. Right, so, so great conversation thus far, Ashok. I think we're going to um, play a little game now. Um, so we have a game that we play every time we have one of these sessions. Um, it's, a, it's a guessing game with the audience. So um, we'll pull up a poll. Um, and, and Ashok's gone ahead and provided us with uh, two truths and a lie uh, about himself. I don't know the answers to these either. I actually don't even know what they are. So we'll all vote on them. And uh, uh, then, then we'll get the answer here. Let's see. Worked on an offshore oil rig. Practice Japanese archery, loves to eat but hates to cook. I, I, I can I can empathize with that one. Um, let's go see. I'm gonna vote too. Um, I think you don't like to cook. I think that's my guess. Seems like uh, the audience is is pretty torn here, but they tend to agree with me. Oh no, they are they're. Let's just give it a few more seconds here, and then we'll we'll find out which of these is is true. Not a lot of faith in your cooking right now, Ashok. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're getting more balance. All right, let's, let's go ahead and uh, uh, hear the answer then. Why don't you talk it through? The then? Why don't you talk? Um, so yeah, the the lie is that um, this was a bit of a a trick. Uh, uh, kind of choice, I guess, but I, I do love to eat and I do love to cook. Um, so, so that, that, that is a lie. <laughs> uh, well, great. Um, very fun. Uh, uh well, great, I think at uh, this point we can, uh, we can turn it over to some questions from the audience. Um, uh, I'm going to pull up the Q and a over in the sidebar and I can kind of just read them out to you. And, and for folks in the audience, there's this Q and a, um, sidebar that you'll see, and you can upvote questions if you'd like. 
Um, so the first one is from Kaima Zerbe. Uh, so the first Hi, one so, is thanks so much for sharing. Can you please comment on navigating the trajectory for securing funding support? So maybe just talking more about how do you figure out how to get funding, um, maybe in ensuing rounds as well. Yeah, so I think um, kind of implicit in what I was talking about our strategy, but uh, but to kind of give a little more color there. Um, what um, so we decided that we didn't want to go the traditional VC route. Uh, we didn't want to take like we didn't want one VC that would put in just a ton of money um, and kind of run the company because uh, because we knew our idea was kind of difficult. We knew that there was going to be a period of development required, um, and so so we decided to kind of take that slowly, right? And and this is a little bit contrary, I think, to. I mean, most startups want to just haul in as much cash as they can, and then they're like, oh, we're good for five years. Uh, but what, what comes along with that is huge oversight, right? Because at that point, you know, what your funder says goes. And if they're like, well, you know, out of your three projects, we hate these two projects, focus on this project. That's what you got to do. Uh, so So we kind of decided early on that we are going to, take kind of like stepping stones to funding um, and then bring on more strategic partnerships, uh, people that were willing to go like the, the you know, the, the long haul um, and, and were, you know, embraced that kind of idea. Um, but to, you know, like you said, we are, you know, we are heading to the clinic next year. And, and that was kind of a, a smaller version of what we're trying to do, right? So, uh, so we, you know, to, to make, the, the the VCs happy and to to show progress, we decided even in our strategy, we can kind of pass this out, right? So so we don't have to go for the for the home run from like you know our, our first attempt. Uh, let's kind of chip away at this and and add value and then bring on more funding as we need to progress, right? Because it's you know whenever you like I, I think as a startup if you haul in this huge round of cash uh the you know there's always this expectation of like what have you done right like yeah. okay so we gave you 50 million bucks where's your drug when are we going to the clinic what's happening right but but if you take in a, a smaller amount of money you can show progress and you can then bring on more rounds of funding um and and that doesn't work for everybody uh you know like cellular therapies that's kind of difficult because you need a lot of money up front to just tool up yeah. uh but uh but for us that has worked pretty well and and the founders still have uh, a lot of say in in what happens are, are you maybe it's a follow-up question for me are you are you worried about kind of this like stepwise funding approach in, in the current environment uh, uh the, i guess the current macroeconomic environment I mean, it's 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 there's there's all risk kind of this risk benefit analysis, right? And and so so yeah, I mean, you know, the the risk of not taking a huge round of cash is now you know you have to go back at some point and get more cash. Yeah. Um, but but that's again where I think um, having strategic partners uh, showing good progress, um, where you know hopefully they won't let you just go under just for the sake of some money, you know, uh, they, they'll continue to kind of support you. Um, that's, that's kind of, uh, and then just like, like, like I said, we, we had this kind of stepping stone approach where we said, okay, we're going to get a simplified version of our drug into the clinic as soon as possible. Um, and, and so, so then that helps us with that next round of funding, right? We, we can show the data package. We can show, you know, our IND and say, Hey, we are ready to go to the clinic. Are you guys ready to fund us? You know, yeah. that's a very diff different pro proposition at that point than coming to a VC and send, saying, you know, oh, we've been doing this for two years. Here's a great idea. Can you give us more money? You know, yeah. it's that's that's a harder sell, I think. Yeah, I think in the clinic definitely carries a little more weight than some slides and some, some data. Um, for sure. So uh, another question here from Den. Uh, thanks for sharing your journey with us, Ashok. Do you have any tips for early founders? Um, what founders um, should early founders not overlook? Um, team, team, team. Um, I, I, I just can't say that enough. Um, the, the whole reason, uh, link launched successfully and link survived COVID was because of the team. Um, if we were like, if we had started with 
five or six random people and we had to tool up the lab and get going and then go through COVID, I, I think we would be in a much different position right now. Uh, but having a, a core, and, 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 and I understand that this is not possible for everybody, but, but having a core group that had already worked well together, uh, that knew the technology, knew the science, uh, you know, on day one, we didn't have to do like, here's your introduction to link, you know, <laughs> they were like, okay, let's go, what do we need to order? What's missing in the lab? You know, that's, that's a very different uh, setup. Um, so, so I would, I would just say, build your team, uh, you know, as as well as possible, and and work with people that that you like and get along with. Because a startup is stressful; it's 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 yeah. difficult. Yeah. Um, you you don't want people that are like just not getting along. You know, that's that's a that's a hard way to to start a company. Uh, here, here here's uh, one for you that I think you'll you'll enjoy. Um, is industry scientists research more monotonous versus academic scientists? <laughs> um, uh no uh it's not more mon monotonous uh it could uh, there, there could be i think the perception uh, maybe partly true uh that there is less freedom uh but but i think that's mainly a perception because even in even in academia you know like uh when we were when we were coming up with this link idea we were trying to apply for grants for like you know uh, uh for ovarian cancer and you know kind of across the board the nih would come back to us and say jim olson is not you know a, a, an obgyn oncologist he's a pediatric brain cancer doctor why are you applying for an ovarian you know we don't think you can do ovarian cancer and we were like what <laughs> you know uh so so th there's this perception that in academia you can do whatever and every day is different uh but but i don't think that's really true at least you know my experience hasn't been that um and and in industry i think again i think if you so this is why i didn't want to join pharma or biotech early on right because i think it could become very monotonous yeah. where you know you're the eliza person or you're the you know protein purification person and, and that's all you do yeah. but in a startup i think like our team has to wear multiple hats and and you know sometimes i think they would be happy to just do one thing but yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but we can't <laughs> that's funny um so uh here's a question i guess you know kind of related to building your team building out your, your automation um do you have any advice for identifying and optimizing inefficiencies in your r d pipeline this is a pretty heavy one pretty heavy one uh well I mean, there are, there are many ways to do this. Uh, and again, uh, a database system is very important uh, because, because one of the issues with bringing on automation is that the volume of data can be overwhelming. Right. So, so if you're if you're kind of used to your bench science like level of output and then you bring on automation, you like three, five, 10 X that output, suddenly you're just inundated with data, right? And yeah. so um, so having good software in place, having good uh, kind of uh, uh, analysis packages and, and kind of a, a team set up to deal with that kind of data is, is important. And, um, and, and kind of smoothing out inefficiencies become important, right? So, um, so I, I think the, the way you build, and, and we are still working on this, uh, an efficient pipeline is you constantly question and you constantly stress test the pipeline, right? You're, you're like, why did this one fail? Why did this you know, position fail? Why did this experiment go down? Um, but then you have this like layer of, uh, um, you know, database management that's tracking everything all the time. So it's very easy for me to see something like, uh, ideally, you see the experiment going wrong before it's actually gone wrong, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's I think, the, the pinnacle of kind of efficiency. Are you there yet? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe one more question for you here. Uh, how do you think about competition? Are you worried about competition in the field? Do you sort of just do your own thing? Um, how does that play in? I mean... Yeah, 
competition is 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 huge. It's 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 definitely a problem. Um, but you know, I, I, ideas are kind of a, a lot of people can have a good idea, right? And and I think the the especially the biotech space, there's a lot of smart people that are going to think of very similar things. Um, and I think it just comes back to uh, you know execution, and and it comes back to the previous question of efficiency, uh, because the the way we deal with competition is is not necessarily like oh you know um, we we are happy to see people take similar ideas to the clinic ahead of us because we almost look at that as kind of a de-risking strategy, right? We're, we're kind of like, oh, you know, how is this going to work out? Are they going to be successful? Um, you know, you don't have to be first in class if you're best in class, right? So, um, so, so we just, you know, we just move, move, move. Uh, we try to be efficient. Uh, we, we try to keep a, an eye to kind of the big idea because that's where a lot of the field is not initially going because again, they're bored and their their funders are saying, don't do this. This is these are these high risk. Um, that's like our playground, right? So many good sound bites here. You don't have to so be first in class when you're, if you're best in class, Ashok. It's it's always always <laughs> great to talk to you. Um, well, thank you so much uh, for well, your time here. I think we're gonna um, uh, end the Q and A. Um, it's just been really a pleasure um, to meet your show. Uh, before we wrap up today's episode, I did want to take a quick second to tease our speaker for next month. Uh, so next month, uh, actually, it's going to be a month break, and we'll be back on September 22nd uh, with an episode featuring Alex Martinko, who is a co-founder and senior director of approaching uh, engineering at Carrier Biotherapeutics, which he co-founded with his PI and a postdoc he worked with during his PhD program at UCSF. Um, all of the attendees today are already registered, so you'll get an email about two weeks before. You'll not need to register again, uh, but please join us on, on September 22nd. And then again, finally, Ashok, thank you so much uh, for attending Founders Chat. If, if folks would like to learn more about Link, you can find them via their website. Or via their website. Um, and then uh, same with Benchling and, and Quartzy. Uh, please visit our websites um, or reach out uh, to me if, if you'd like to, to chat more. So thanks so much. Thanks, Sean. This was this was awesome, and and thanks to everyone that attended and and Benchling for hosting. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thanks, thanks, everyone. Thanks.